Um, if you can take your Bibles and open them to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, we are going to be continuing our study back in the book of Romans. Uh, we, we've been going through, we went through the book of Romans all last year until the end, and then we switched over to Thanksgiving and Advent. Now we are back in Romans, Romans chapter 8, and we're going to begin this morning with a, a verse that I'm sure all of you have heard before, most of you recognize, many of you may have even memorized it. It's Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28. And it goes like this. We, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. Uh, this is a verse I, I, I think that's often misunderstood because it's, it's kind of taken out of context in which it's written in. The, the context, a, a lot of the context, as we'll see in a moment when we read, Romans chapter 8, we're going to read verses 1 through 30 in just a minute. A lot of that context has to do with sufferings, with, with groanings, with trials, with difficulties. And, and so that promise is given to us to comfort us in the midst of, of tribulation and trial. With that in mind, let's read from Romans chapter 8, reading verses 1 through 30. If you're able this morning, will you stand for the reading of God's holy word? Therefore, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of a sinful man to be a sin offering. So he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what the, that nature desires, but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind of the sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation. But it's not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. By him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. For I consider that our present sufferings aren't worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. But in this hope we are saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know how we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the likeness of his Son, 
that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. This is God's word. You may be seated. So uh, to, to review, uh, and, and, and we've already seen this in, in Romans chapter 8, uh, you'll, you'll find um, in your bulletin an outline, and actually on, on the back of this morning's outline, there's a, there's a, a whole page I, I want you to look at, because this, this whole page reviews everything we've already seen in, in Romans chapter 8, a, a chapter that many have called the best or the most precious chapter in, in all the Bible. And one of the things we've seen is that Christianity is more about more than just rules, right? If all we needed were better rules, why would Jesus have needed to come? Christianity is, is a supernatural faith. We, we believe that God, in, in his mercy, <laughs> brings us to Christ, and, and in Christ, through Christ's graciousness, brings about divine transformation in us, through the power of his Holy Spirit. So, so Christianity isn't just about pulling up your boot, yourself by your bootstraps and becoming a better person. Christianity is about God transforming you into a better person. When God calls you to become something, he, he doesn't just leave you to yourself to do it. He gives you his spirit to help transform you. And, and in Romans chapter 8, one of the reasons it's such a, a hallowed chapter in God's word is it, it shows us what this new life in the spirit of God looks like. As we read through Romans chapter eight, you, you read how many times the word spirit came up. This, this is God's spirit in us. And so Paul in this chapter paints a beautiful picture of what new life in Christ looks like. So look at this again on the back of your outline. Uh, when, when we are in Christ, when we're united to Christ by faith and he gives us his, his spirit, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The, the law can't condemn us any longer. We're, we're free from it in, in, in that sense. It, the law has guiding power but not condemning power in our lives because Christ took our condemnation on our behalf on the cross. Not only that, we have this new identity and it's wrapped up in Christ, right? There's now no condemnation for who? Not, there, there are people in this world for whom there is condemnation coming, but for those who are in Christ, there is now no condemnation. We have this new identity that's wrapped up in our union with Christ that we have by faith. Not only that, we, we have this new freedom from the law of sin and death. Verse 2, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of, of sin and death. So, so the law can't sentence us to death. Christ has borne that penalty on our behalf. He's fulfilled the law on our behalf. Not only that, we, we have a new mind, a new mind that is set on the Spirit's desires. Verse 5, those who live in accordance to the sinful nature have their mind set on what that nature desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. So as, as Christians, we think differently. We, we, we think differently about people. People aren't just commodities that, that, that can improve our lives. No, people are, are image bearers of God. We, we, we think differently of, of bad people, right? Uh, there's sometimes where certain people in my life, um, you know, some driver cuts us off and, and uh, you know, let's get his license plate. Let's call, let's call Brent and report him or, or, or something like that. And I, I, I say, maybe they're just having a really bad day. Oh, dad, come on. Well, oh, I just gave away who, who says those things. So. <laughs> Sorry about that. But, 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 but we think differently about people in our life. We, we, we show compassion. We show patience. We, we show mercy. We recognize that we, we don't expect everyone to live the way we're called to live because their mindsets are, are different. We as Christians, we think differently about the world and about others and about the future and about life. Not only that, we, we have a new presence. By the way, I've done a whole sermon on each one of these. They're all on the website. If, if any of these stick out and you miss them, go back, give it a listen. We have this new presence, the Holy Spirit, verse 9. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. The, the, the Spirit lives inside us, so we're no longer slaves to our old sin nature. We, we have God's Spirit inside us guiding us. Uh, creating us in us new desires and new affections to be obedient to him and to love his law. Not only that, we, we have this new hope. 
Verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit who lives in you. Um, I'm waiting for the day when a financial planner sits down with me and says, Mr. Jacobson, what are your hopes for the future? I'm going to answer, resurrection, baby. That's, that's my hope for the future. But, but, and, and that should be all of our hopes for the future as Christians. Look, my, my hope is I'm not, and it's a certain hope, I'm not going to be in the ground in a box forever. My body might be there for a little while, but it's going to rise again in a glorified body like Christ. Uh, so if you know any financial planners who use that as part of their um, inquiry, send them my way especially if they don't know Christ yet. So um, we, we have this new hope, this new, resur- this new hope in, in the resurrection, just as the Spirit raised Christ Jesus from the dead, that same Spirit lives in us, he's going to raise us from the dead as well. There, there's a new battle we fight. We, we put to death the deeds of the flesh. We, we mortify it, right? Remember those words of John Owen, be killing sin or it will be killing you. Verse 13, if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you'll live. So, so we are a people who fight sin. We are, we are people who confess sin. We are people who, who don't become comfortable with sin. Yet some of you remember what it was like when you sinned before Christ. You didn't care. And then you became a Christian, and when you sinned, guess what? You were miserable. That's a blessing. So, so, so when you sin as a Christian because we will still sin, unfortunately. When, when you sin, don't, don't believe the lie that, well, I must not be a Christian anymore. Take comfort in the fact that the Spirit is convicting you of your sin and causing you to repent and be conformed more into the likeness of Christ. So we have this new battle. We have this new inheritance. If we're children, verse 17, then we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. So, so Christ's inheritance is ours because we're in this union with him. So, so we get to partake, the, the Bible says we're even now seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. His, his inheritance is, is ours. Not only that, in the spirit we have this, we have this new spirit by which we cry, Abba, Father. So, so most of the, the people in this world relate to God either as a stranger. Some people relate to God as a boss. Well, as long as I punch my time clock and, and do my work, I'll get my pay and hopefully not fired. We relate to God as Father. This is, this is a diminutive term, this term Abba. It's, it's, it's like Daddy. This, this is that new spirit by which we can have this intimate relationship with God where we need no longer to have a spirit of fear because there's no condemnation for us, right? We have this new spirit by which we cry out to to our Papa in heaven. Not only that, we have this new helper in prayer, verse 26. This is the, the last sermon I preached before we came into the, the Thanksgiving and Advent season. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. So, so even our prayer life while God calls us to pray, he helps us with that through his spirit in us. And today I want to talk about this new confidence that we have. Romans 8, 28. Again, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. Uh, now you can turn to the front of, of your outline and we're going to look at that new confidence that we now have. And some of you are astute and have read ahead, and you're saying, Pastor Robert, the first three points are all the exact same words. This is true, but you'll notice there's different bolding in them. So I'm going to focus those first three points. Same verse, we're just going to focus in bold on those first, on on those different letter, on those different phrases that are, that are in bold. So first, we have this new confidence, right? Now, um, I mentioned at the beginning of the message, there's some people who misread this text. And, and do you remember the Princess Bride? 
I don't think it means what you think it means, right? You know, that, that there's some people who read this text and they think, well, that means that everything that's going to happen to me as a Christian now, even though it looks bad, is really a good thing. That's not really what the text says. That's, that's, more, uh, that's more Buddhist kind of thinking. If, if I understand Buddhist uh, faith correctly, or I should say really philosophy correctly, that they don't really believe that evil exists. They, they, they believe you're either enlightened or unenlightened, and, and suffering's an illusion. That's, that's not what this text is saying. No, evil's real, suffering's real, hardship, all those things are, are real. And so this, this passage isn't saying that, well, evil or things that aren't good are really good. It's, it's also not saying that as Christians, we get cocooned from evil. There, there's some people who think, well, now that I'm a Christian, um, nothing bad's going to ever happen to me. That, that's not what it's saying. And, and in fact, later on in Romans 8, we're going to see how Christians face tribulation, famine, distress. And if, 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 if you look ahead uh, where we get to that, that, that wonderful verse, Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. No. Yet Christians may still face some of those things, but in facing those things, those things aren't going to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Again, in the big context of Romans chapter 8, part of what it's talking about is the suffering and hardship we have to do, that we don't do this alone. So this verse isn't saying that when bad things happen, it's really okay because it's really good. If that were the case, I think Jesus would have responded differently at at Lazarus' tomb, right? Remember how that went down? Jesus Jesus didn't show up at Lazarus' tomb and say, hey, everybody, cheer up. This is really a good thing. He he already knew what he was going to do. He already knew he was going to call Lazarus forth from the grave He he didn't show up and say, hey, joke's on you. No, he showed up and what did he do? He cried. He he, he was angry at death when he called forth Lazarus from from the grave. And, And so this text isn't saying that we are cocooned or isolated from evil as Christians. We're not cocooned or isolated from hardship. It's, it's also not saying that evil or hardship aren't real things. But what this text is telling us is, is that God is at work in the universe, in his sovereign providential governance of the universe, that, that even when we face hardship, when we fall, when we fail, God will use those things and can use those things ultimately to accomplish his purposes. So, point number one, we know that in all things God is working for the good of those who love him, okay? So, there's a lot of things we don't know, right? We, we don't know a lot about the future. Uh, we know some things about the future. There, there are a lot of things we don't know about God. God, the, <laughs> never think that the Bible is an exhaustive work on God. The infinite God can be contained in these pages of scripture, no. It shows us a lot about God. It shows us what we need about God. But it, there's, there's a whole lot of stuff about God that we don't know. What, what does the Bible say in, in Deuteronomy? The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed to us are for us and our children to obey. I think it's 28, 28. I might be wrong. So, so there are a lot of things we don't know. And in fact, earlier on, as we read in Romans eight twenty six, look at it with me. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. So, so Paul just tells us, look, there's sometimes we don't even know what to pray for. And then he contrasts that with what we do know. And what he contrasts that with is what we do know is that in all things, God is working for the good of those who love him. So when we don't understand what God is doing, and, and, and I think that's one, of the, one, that's one of the greatest trials for Christians, right? Stuff happens, and it normally happens at really bad time. And, and 
Guess what? Even your pastor has at times looked up to heaven and said, God, what are you thinking? I, I suspect there's some of you who've done that as well. Right? I, I, I don't have time to go through all the times in my life when that's happened. Pro- probably the, you know, I, I remember Amy and I um, were trying to get pregnant. And, and for those of you who don't know us, we, we, we aren't able to have biological children. So we adopted two kids, two wonderful kids, Grace and Paul, who we love dearly and um, immensely. But we'd gone to Bible college, we'd gone to seminary, we'd counseled young people who were getting pregnant and un- unmarried young people who were getting pregnant in back seats of cars. And here we are who've lived our lives right before God and, and we can't have kids. God, what are you thinking? Why not? Why are you making us go through this? On the flip side, you know, you guys know Grace and Paul, and you, you know what a great part they are of this church and, and how much we love them and how much you love them, and, and so we praise God for that. And so we, we can kind of see how that comes full circle, but, but oftentimes in life we, we don't get to see that. So, so there are things we don't know. There's a lot of things we don't know, but there are things we can know one of the things Paul says, we know as Christians that in all things God is working for the good of those who love him. We know that, point two, in all things God's working. Christians experience all things. Christians still get cancer. Christians still battle uh, addictions. Christians face the same sickness as a lot of other people face. The same calamities a lot of other people face. We, we still have earthquakes, right? That, it's, when an earthquake happens, wouldn't it be cool if like all the Christian godly homes were, you know, stayed up and every, all, the, all the pagan unbeliever homes fell down? You know, you, you'd think maybe the, the pagan unbelievers would say, hey, you, you know, what's going on here? But that's not how it works, right? Rain falls on the just and the unjust. We know that in all things, God is working for the good of those who love him. I, I don't think, it, it doesn't say in some things, it says in all things. And, and that leads me to believe that, that the Sunday school song is really true. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Not just part of the world, the whole world. He's got you and me, sister, in his hands. But, 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 but that he's got us in his hands in all things. I, I, I really believe that. After all, when Jesus, before he ascended into heaven, what did he say to his disciples? All authority in heaven and on earth have been given unto me. Not some of the authority in heaven and some of the authority on earth. All of it have been given unto me. He governs it all. And there's certain things that he, he allows to take place even in the lives of the ones he loves who are called according to his pur- pur- purpose that are difficult, that are hard. Listen to what John Newton, the former slave trader turned pastor, wrote. He, he also wrote the hymn Amazing Grace. Everything is needful that he sends and nothing can be needful that he withholds. Hmm. Now, in, in thinking about this, this idea that in all things, God is working for the good of those who love him, th- this, this is really hard for us as Americans because we have this kind of American optimism that everything's gonna turn out great for us. A, a lot of people in the world, the rest of the world, don't have that, but, but we think differently about ourselves, and, and we have this almost kind of entitlement mentality that my life should turn out great. And, and yet, if, if we take a good look at this broken and fallen world, we really shouldn't expect things to turn out great. We should expect them to kind of fall apart, 
right? Isn't that what we learned in fifth grade science? The law of entropy, things go from order to disorder, things fall apart, the second law of thermodynamics, right? I, I, I hate to sound like Eeyore, but if we really look at life and society and nature and, and the curse and entropy, things fall apart. Furnaces fall apart, houses fall apart, relationships fall apart, churches even fall apart. This really kind of shouldn't surprise us, and yet we always seem to be shocked when it happens. And, and, and one application of this verse, I think, is that when we, when we see things turning out for good in our lives, our hearts should overflow with thanksgiving to God for it. Because the natural course is toward decay. So when things are really good, we, th- th- that shouldn't be our, our default expectation. We, we, we default expect everything to go good, and when things go bad, we want to sue somebody. We, we should default expect things to go poorly, and when things go well, we should rejoice and give thanks to God. Because we get to see him accomplishing his purposes in all things. Point three, we know that in all things, God is, is working. So, so we believe God is an active God. We as Christians are not deists. So a lot of the founding father were deists. Um, that, that, that deists were people who believed that God existed, that he kind of created the world and spun it off into the universe and hoped it go well. Kind of like a bowler, right? You got the world, you bowl, then you let it go and, and, and you watch. That, that's kind of deistic thought. That, that is not what the Bible teaches. The, the Bible teaches that in him we live and move and have our being. The, the Bible teaches that God is, is, is transcendent, yes, in the sense that he's holy and unlike us, but also that he's imminent in the sense that he's near and active in his creation. So, so we know that God is, is working. God isn't distant. He's not far off. He is he's working and he's working And in his working, he can use everything to accomplish his purposes. So so you know songs like um, Laura Story's Blessings, right? Some of you might have heard it on the radio. We pray for blessings. We pray for peace. Comfort for family. Protection while we sleep. We pray for healing and for prosperity. We, we pray that your mighty hand, for your mighty hand to ease our sufferings. And all the while, you hear each spoken need. Yet you love us too much to give us lesser things. Because what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know that you're near? What if the trials of this life are your mercies in disguise. God is working. I, um, last year, I I got a phone call out of the blue um, from from this movie director. He was shooting a a made-for-TV movie for a lifetime. Um, I think it was called The Good Samaritan, and they needed a church to shoot some scenes in, and um, we, we talked it over and they were going to give a nice little donation to the church. And I said, yeah, come on up. And so we had a move film crew and everything up here. And, and I sat and had lunch with the director, him and his wife. And we sat outside and he's a believer and, and so is his wife. And, and they were sharing with me a story about their son, Michael. Michael was 16 years old and could pitch a hundred mile per hour fastball at 16, which is, he, he was being scouted. Um, impressive young man. And then he had a really funky hand injury, and they went to repair it, and and essentially, they were unable to repair it in such a way where he'd ever be able to pitch again. And and so here you had this this young man who's a follower of Christ, a a devout believer. He wanted to use his, his platform in Major League Baseball as a testimony to God's glory, and now he can't pitch. And... And so he said, well, I, I think I just want to go to college then, so I need to figure out some kind of sport. He, he, I mean, he, kid's obviously a, an athlete, and so he said, you know what, I'll, I'll try rowing. And, and so he, he joined the, the crew team, and he started rowing, and, and uh, one of the exercises they have in this rowing crew team is there's, there's a special kind of machine where you have to row for like 45 minutes straight. It's this exercise, and most of the time when guys do this, they, they throw up. Well, he... he he almost passed out, which, was, which happens occasionally, but it, 
it led his coach to say, you know what, you should, you should go get a checkup. And so he went and got a checkup and got an EKG. And the EKG was okay, but, but for a young man in this kind of peak physical health, he said, you know what, let's do a heart MRI. And they, they found a deformity in his heart, a deformity that, that normally fully manifests itself. Um, most people, when they hit 21 or 22, just drop dead because it's one of those things that you, you don't, you, there's not like a default test for. You can only see it by doing a heart MRI. And, and so um, that's how they were able to discover what was, what was wrong with him. And they did open heart surgery on him last, uh, last year. And, and this surgery essentially saved his life. So, so here you have a young man thinking, God, I'm a pitcher. What in the world are you doing to me? I, I've worked so hard for this, and now I can't play baseball anymore? What are you thinking? And God's saying, I, I think I want to save your life. God's working. We, we know the story of Joseph, right? Joseph and, and his multicolored coat, that his brothers were jealous of, maybe not of the coat, but at least of the favor uh, he was getting and they weren't. And, and, and Joseph, the dreamer, sharing his dreams, right? His, his brother's not really liking the dreams, getting a little jealous. And, and one day uh, they end up faking their brother's death and instead selling him into slavery. He, he sold into slavery in Egypt where he, he does really well in Potiphar's house and they get falsely accused of, of trying to hit on Potiphar's wife, ends up in jail, interprets more dreams, ends up being prime minister of all of Egypt. Famine strikes throughout the land. The whole family comes down to Egypt to buy food. He recognizes his brothers. He saves his family. There's reconciliation. Their dad dies. His brothers are, are scared to death. They come to him. You know, please don't kill us now that dad's dead. He says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And the saving of many lives. God was at work. You, you can see it after the fact. You weren't able to see it when they were going through it. And, and don't we love these kind of stories where it's all tied together in a nice, neat bow? But, but, but let's be honest. Most of the time, we don't, we don't get to see it all tied up with a bow. Not on this side of glory. I mean, I've got, I've got five or six stories like that in my life where I can see things tied up neatly with a bow, but I've got a hundred others where I still have no clue what God was doing or is doing. And yet that's why we need a passage like this where Paul tells us with certainty that we can know that in all things, even in the bad stuff, God is working. And, and his goal is to work for the good of those who loves him, love him, who are called according to his purpose. Notice, God isn't working this way for everyone. Th this promise is not for the world. This promise is for a very specific group of people, those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. I, I, I believe those are two separate statements about the same group of, of people. And the group of people is you, if you're a Christian here this morning. If, you've loved, if you love God, if you've been, then you've been called according to purpose. That's, that, that's you, church. And, and, and when it says those who love God, don't, don't read this in such a way where you think, well, God's working everything for my good as long as I'm loving him with my whole heart that day. But as soon as I'm not loving him all as, as much as I need to be loving him, then all bets are off. No. Do you love God? It, you know, if you love God, you love him because he first loved you. That's what John 14, 419 tells us. We love him because he first loved us. And 1 John also tells us what love is, what, what love looks like. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. 1 John says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. God, God has already shown us what real love looks like. God, God in his mercy 
looked on our brokenness and our fallenness, and he took on flesh and became a man to undo what man had done. He, he entered into our brokenness in the person of Jesus, who, who lived a, a life of perfect obedience, a sinless life, a, a life that always glorified and was always obedient and always faithful to God, his Father, the life we should all be living, but none of us ever have. And he laid that down, that perfect life, as a sacrifice. As a sacrifice for sin. As a sacrifice for us. And in rising from the dead, he conquered death. So that if we place our trust in him and his life, death, and resurrection, we too will rise from the dead. So so when the Bible talks about his love, it's not just, hey, God's up in heaven and he's got really warm, mushy teenager kind of love feelings for you. No, it's a love that's demonstrated by action. It's a love that's evident. And and so when I ask you, do you love God? I'm not just asking, do you have really warm, gushy feelings about God? When, When people look at me, I hope most of you who know me well would be able to say, you know what? Pastor Robert, he really loves Amy a lot. I, I, you, you might not be able, and, and I think you'd say that not just because I'm glad to tell anybody that, but, but I think because of the way I live my life and demonstrate my love for he, her, if you've observed me, you know that I love my wife a lot. When, when people look at you, Do they say, you know, Gary, he really loves Jesus a lot. Dennis, he really loves Jesus a lot. Linda, she really loves Jesus a lot. I picked those three because I know they're all in the affirmative. People would say, yes, they really do love Jesus a lot. And I I pray that's true. Now, don't any of you, why didn't Pastor Robert pick me? Okay, I'm just sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, Ask yourself, is, is there evidences of your love for God? Do you love God? And, and again, my, my hope is that the answer to, all, to the answer to that question for all of you is a resounding yes. Let me tell you all the reasons why I love him. But, but if you're here this morning and you're not sure if you love him, ask him to help you love him. Ask him to open your eyes to see the beauty and wonder of what he's done for you in Christ. Maybe now he might even be working in your heart to draw you to himself. And if you have any questions about that, I'd I'd love to talk to you about that. Back to the text. So for this group of people who love God, who've been called according to his purpose, in all things God is working for their good, what is that good? Because this is important, because what the good that's talked about here may not be the good we have in mind, right? What, what's the good we have in mind for our lives? Luxury cars, exotic vacations, full banks accounts, never having to work again. Is that the good God has for most of us? I, I don't think so. In, in fact, I, I think Paul's really clear about the good that he has for us. And it's seen in the next two verses, which we're going to talk more about next week. Look at verse 29 and verse 30. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Friends, God is working all things for our ultimate good, and the ultimate good that I think Paul is pointing to is found in verse 29 and 30. The first part of that ultimate good is being conformed in the likeness of his son. How many of you know that if you were made more like Jesus, that would be a really good thing? That'd be a good thing for you. That'd be a good thing for your neighbors. That'd be a good thing for your family. That'd be a great thing for the whole world. This is part of the good that God is working in you. And I think the other part of the good is this, what we see in in the end of verse 30. Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. 
you're going to be glorious one day. I think it was C.S. Lewis said, if people realize, and I'm paraphrasing, if people realized what the Bible promises they will become, mortals would be tempted to worship us in our glorified bodies. We, we are going to be glorious. There's not going to be any more broken toes or any more concussions. We, we were talking about, uh, <laughs> we, we're, we're going to be glorious. We're, we're going to be something that no eye has seen before. We're going to be conformed into the likeness of Christ. And we will get these glorified bodies just like he had when he rose Friends, that's, that's our ultimate good. There are people who spend hours and hours a week working out at the gym, and, and that's fine. That's, I have no problem with that, but, but their end goal is, is to get these kind of glorious bodies, that these hard bodies that they're just working on over and over again. Friends, I, I don't want to say don't waste your time. I mean, go to the gym, be healthy. But your glorious body isn't going to be here on this side of heaven, okay? It's, it's going to be in glory, and it's going to be more glorious than anything you could ever put together in a gym. Let's close this morning in prayer. Lord, we bless you and we thank you and we praise you for your kindness toward us. In, in this world where there's constant decay, where there's sickness, where there's war, where there's crime, where there's rumors of wars, where there's fires, where there's earthquakes, where there's floods, we have experienced so much blessing and good in our temporal life, but what is more and greater than the blessing and good we've already experienced is, is what awaits us as we're conformed in the image of Christ. As one day we will receive glorified bodies on that day when the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. Lord, that is the ultimate good we have our eyes fixed on. And as we wait that day, may we embrace with courage the new confidence that you give us in your word that in all things you are working for our good. We love you, Jesus.